This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. This UCTV podcast is sponsored in part by Audible.com, your destination for the widest selection of digital audiobooks available, including many by guests you've seen on UCTV. Audible.com is offering UCTV viewers a free 30-day trial subscription and one free audiobook download. Just visit audibletrial.com slash UCTV to sign up. And thanks. Welcome everyone to the 99th Annual Faculty Research Lectures 2012. Since 1913, Berkeley's Academic Senate has honored faculty members for their exceptionally distinguished scholarship by offering a celebrated public forum for the presentation of scholarly research of the highest caliber. These public lectures give the campus the opportunity to hear from some of our very finest faculty. They showcase and allow us to enjoy Berkeley's comprehensive excellence from the arts and humanities through the social sciences, the sciences, and the professions. Past lectures, including an astounding array of campus notables, and I'm delighted to introduce some distinguished prior faculty research lecturers who are with us today, uh, including uh, Alexander Chorum, Marvin Cohen, this says past winners, but it's actually this year, Jan de Vries, um, John Prausnitz, Randy Sheckman, Gabor Summerjai, Barry Stroud, David Wake, and is there anyone else who came in after? No, okay. Two individuals were chosen to give the 2012 lectures, Terry Speed, Professor of Statistics, and Jan de Vries, Professor of Economics and History. This afternoon, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Professor Speed, the first of our two faculty lecturers. Professor de Vries, de Vries pardon me, will deliver his faculty research lecture in two weeks on Monday, April the 2nd. Professor Terry Speed is a world-renowned scholar who has made pioneering contributions in applying statistical methods to biomedical and genomic data which have been enormously influential and fundamental in advancing research in cancer and other diseases. He now shares his time between the Department of Statistics at UC Berkeley, where he's a professor emeritus, and the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne, Australia, where he's a senior principal research scientist in the bioinformatics division. Terry recalls that he first heard about the Berkeley Statistics Department in 1963, in his third year at Melbourne, where he was majoring in mathematics and statistics. Excited by Berkeley's approach to statistics with its, at the time, untraditional concepts, he applied for and was accepted to UC Berkeley's statistics PhD program for 1965-66. Uh, unfortunately, the financial package could not support both him and his partner, so he had to decline. So what's new? <laughs> 1965, imagine. <laughs> well, Terry's career path took him to Monash University, where he completed his PhD in 1969, then to England to work at the Manchester Sheffield School of Probability and Statistics, then on to the University of Western Australia in Perth. He left the university in 1982 to work at Australia's large multidisciplinary scientific organization, the Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Research Organization, CSIRO, as it's well known. This whole time, Berkeley statistics remained an important influence in his life. In 1984, on a two-month sabbatical visit to Berkeley, he was invited by the chair of the department to become a member of the department a position that he took up in 1987 as a tenured professor. He then 
two years later, I guess, got drafted into administration and served as chair of the department from 1989 to 1993. In 1997, he also became a senior principal research fellow and joint head of genetics and bioinformatics at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, and since 2006 is head of bioinformatics there. Uh, Terry retired from teaching at Berkeley at the end of 2008, 2009, although he still has PhD students and postdoctoral fellows and a number of continuing collaborations at Berkeley. A prolific scholar, he has co-authored over 300 refereed articles in journals such as Nature and the Annals of Statistics. He contributes a regular column, Terence's Stuff, to the Institute of Mathematical Statistics Bulletin. He's a much sought after speaker worldwide with a dizzying travel, travel schedule delivering a number of prestigious named lectures. He's also highly solicited as a consultant and scientific advisory board member. He's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the American Statistical Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Australian Academy of Science. He's received various honors and awards, too numerous to mention. The nomination for faculty lecturer also recognized Terry as an extraordinary teacher and advisor and, a mo and as a most inspiring and generous mentor. It's my great pleasure to call up Professor Terry Speed, who will lecture on, and I quote, extracting more information out of data. Please welcome Professor Terry Speed. Thank you very much, Chancellor. And uh, thank you, everyone else, particularly the committee that selected me, but also all of you for coming along. I'm trying to put this light out. Is that uh, possible, Tim? Um, not sure. And I will. I have to begin by explaining this rather weird title. Uh, about, I don't know, 1984, so whenever that was, when I uh, made this visit to Berkeley, I bought a biography of basically the most important statistician in the 20th century. And the motivation for him coming into statistics was described by the director of this place called the Rothamsted Experimental Station. This was 1919. And that Sir John Russell said that he asked R.A. Fisher, the person I'm talking about, to see whether after studying their records, he could tell him whether they were suitable for a proper statistical examination and might be expected to yield more information than they had extracted up to that date. And I just want to mention what the data were that he asked Fisher to examine. This institution, Rothamsted Experimental Station, was started in 1843. And there was a field there called Broadbalk, which had been used in his experimental, agricultural experimental station, different fertilizers, different plants, from 1857 until this time, 1919, without serious examination. And Fisher was asked to look at this data and see whether he could extract more information. And I thought when I read the biography, that's what I think I'm doing trying to extract more information. So from that time onwards, I've decided this is my, my, my uh, sort of aim in life. Now, Fisher actually wrote a paper a little over a year after joining Rothamsted called An Examination of the Yield of Dressed Grain in Broadbalk. That was the field. And uh, about nearly 40 years now, I had a sabbatical at Rothamsted, and I used to jog around that field. Uh, it's a clay soil with flint stones in it. And I have some Flintstones here as a uh, handful of them, if anybody's interested later. This is probably the most famous agricultural field on the planet. Uh, it is still being experimented now, uh, you know, I think 1857 to now. And uh, it's been an amazing source of statistical inspiration, but basically it got Fisher started, and pretty much the foundation of what we do now goes back to that experience. Okay, so I'm now gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you. You're going to get a glimpse of what statistical analysis means to me. And, of course, you're going to get a glimpse of what Berkeley means to me. Apologies if those colors don't come out too well. 
Uh, and then I'm going to give you three vignettes, which may not be as small as they should be, but we'll see. One will be about molecular evolution, starting in 1992. One will be about genetical recombination, and no apologies for using that old-fashioned word, genetical. And one will be about microarray normalization. And then I'll make some closing remarks. So that's the plan. So first I have to tell you a little bit about what statistical analysis means before illustrating it in the course of uh, these vignettes. I'll start by telling you who I've learned from. And the first person is the guy I mentioned earlier, R.A. Fisher, uh, 1890 to 1992, uh, uh, 1962. I never had a chance to meet him because in my very first statistics course, one day we went in, it's actually exactly uh, 50 years ago, 1962, and uh, the board was pulled down and it said R.A. Fisher was dead. And of course, the class all said, who the hell's R.A. Fisher? Because it was, it was our first course. So I missed the opportunity of getting to know him. He was a Hitchcock lecturer here. They brought him here in 1936 with the possible uh, aim of uh, having him start statistics in Berkeley. This was planned between uh, Raymond Burge in physics and uh, uh, Griffith Evans in mathematics. Didn't work out. He was not such a nice guy from the point of view of buttering up Californians. He was a little bit on the arrogant side. Uh, he didn't uh, give very clear talks. But he was the most famous statistician of the 20th century, and we've all learned an enormous amount from him. The next person was Jersey Naiman. Uh, there are his dates. He's almost, but not quite, a contemporary of Fisher's, but in some sense, another generation. Uh, he wrote a paper once in the 50s called Statistics, the Servant of All Sciences, which describes his attitude. And uh, here's a quote. He was very interested in indeterminism in science. And he did found statistics in Berkeley, as I would guess a very large proportion of you here know. The third person I want to mention is John Tukey, uh, who was uh, basically associated with Princeton for, well, 60 years, let's say, roughly speaking, 1940 to 2000. He also came to Berkeley, but by then we had a statistics department, so we didn't have to ask him would he consider founding one. Uh, here's one of my favorite quotes from Tukey. He has many quotable quotes for a far better an approximate answer to the right question, which is often vague, than an exact answer to the wrong question. Uh, Chugi was in favor of a quick and dirty methods that got to the point rather than fancy methods that failed. And finally, I need to mention my Berkeley colleague and friend, David Friedman, who sadly died not so long ago. Uh, and his uh, philosophy has influenced me enormously as well. And here's one of my favorite quotes of David. At the bottom, my critique is pretty simple-minded. Nobody pays much attention to assumptions. And the technology, there he means the statistical technology, tends to overwhelm common sense. I'm going to just hopefully echo some of these sentiments in my vignettes. Now, here's a quote from Tukey that I like a lot. Best thing about being a statistician, this is from his obituary in the New York Times, uh, is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. So I'll start by just describing three backyards that I was playing in, amazingly, at the same time I was chair. Uh, it's hard to look back and think that I was going to three lab meetings a week, as well as trying to do the boring stuff for the statistics department. Alan Wilson, who will be mentioned shortly, uh, was molecular evolution. Ron Krauss at the Donner Lab was working on cholesterol. And Charles Cantor was doing genomics for a while, uh, being the uh, spearheading the uh, Human Genome Project for the Department of Energy, but not for that long. So that got me started. Now, statistical analysis according to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world I'm typifying, uh, this is Sir David Cox and his colleague Joyce Snell. They wrote a book called Applied Statistics, and its opening words were this. Statistical analysis deals with those aspects of the analysis of data that are not highly specific to particular fields of study. That is, the object is to provide concepts and methods that will, with suitable modification, be applicable in many different fields. Indeed, for him, one of the attractions is precisely this breadth of potential application. I've been wrestling with this tension all my career. Do we stick to things that are not highly specific, or do we get highly specific? Do we go over and go native, or do we stay in our statistics department? And uh, this is a tension you'll see in the vignettes I'm going to mention. Now, this is something really weird, or sort of abstract representation of how I think. Uh, I'm interested in the real world and in questions about the real world. As a statistician, 
uh, I'm interested in helping people use data to address these questions. The tools we use, I think, whether we like it or not, tend to be models. Models of the world, mo mathematical models, and from the point of view of a statistician, usually models with some randomness in them. So I've got their equations and randomness. And finally, uh, answers are, are what we'd like to deliver. I hope you've read my T-shirt to realize that we always have measures of uncertainty associated with our answers. So nothing is certain in the world of statistics. And uh, that's the framework I encourage you to think about as you listen to my vignettes. Now, we're a very odd lot statisticians, very diverse. And here's a, an example of why. Fisher used models a lot, but he never wrote them down. Fisher, I think, abhorred the idea of ever being wrong. So if somebody said, you've made an assumption, and it's clearly false, he would say, I didn't make that assumption. <laughs> you know, uh, and prove, where did I write it down? Naiman loved models. Naiman was a, a, a wholehearted modeler. Chuki almost entirely avoided models. Uh, I mean, he, as I'll tell you later, he created what he called exploratory data analysis, which is really, in theory, maybe not in reality, looking at data without any model in your head. Though, of course, philosophers would argue that you can never do that. You always got something in your head when you look at data. And finally, David Friedman, as you'll remember from the quote, was deeply skeptical of models and uh, made a, a very great contribution to statistics by expl explicating or uh, deconstructing a lot of the models that are in the literature and showing their weaknesses. So with that sort of background, I'm going to ask you to listen to my three vignettes, think about the data, think about the question, think about the model, and uh, well, then I'll sit down and we'll be able to enjoy the refreshments. So. <laughs> I'm going to begin, now, when I talk to students, which is not to say that you're not students, uh, I sometimes pause and say, are there any questions? Now, maybe that's heretical in one of these sort of lectures, but if anybody has a burning question, I, it would really help me, because questions calm me down. So uh, is anybody prepared to help out with a question um, before I move on? Or, for example, I might walk off this podium if you don't ask a question. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> So this is work with Alan Wilson in 1990, uh, and I want to tell you what I think is the motivation. Alan was interested in the origin of humans and other organisms. So, I mean, probably it doesn't take a lot of explanation why we care about evolution, and uh, you know the nature of evolution. So I don't have to push that one too hard. Now here's the team that uh, I'm going to be de describing. Alan regrettably died some time ago now, uh, but was an incredible force around the campus. Barbara Bowman, who is somewhere in there, in there, came to me in the statistical consulting service sometime around about 1890 with, you know, it's always the same, I have a simple statistical problem, would you help us out? And it was to do with molecular evolution. Uh, Arund was one of Alan's students. Uh, Barbara was also one of Alan's students. Trang was one of my students who dived into the problem. And Steve Evans, who's also here somewhere, uh, was a colleague who also picked up on some of the uh, theoretical analyses. So that's the, uh, the, the team that will be behind the stuff I'm telling you about. But of course, Naiman had been there first. Naiman wrote this paper in 1971, Molecular Studies of Evolution, a Source of Novel Statistical Problems. It was buried in a book proceedings and perhaps not terribly widely led, read. But he reported on a paper written in 1989 by Alan Wilson and Vince Sarich. Uh, and as he mentions there, uh, Naiman was in the habit of inviting people from around the campus to speak in his seminar in the statistical laboratory. And these people did on two occasions. And I, I'll explain what that paper was about shortly. And I'll explain a little bit about what Naiman did shortly too. But before, a little bit of background on evolution using molecules. Forgive me if this is too heavy. It'll, it'll be over soon, and uh, then there'll be the second vignette, which will be like wiping the slate clean and beginning at easy stuff again. So if it gets too heavy, apologies, and just be patient. So first of all, something which I would say is not terribly controversial. <laughs> DNA is passed from parents to offspring with some relatively unchanged. This is definitely controversial. Molecular evolution is dominated by mutations that are neutral from the standpoint of natural selection. Uh, Kimura propounded this in 1968, and independently, uh, King and Jukes, they're highlighted, of course, because Tom Jukes was uh, a, a very prominent scholar in uh, 
Berkeley, and uh, King was his collaborator on this paper, uh, and that was entitled Non-Darwinian Evolution. So molecular evolution with neutral mutations rather than the proverbial selection survival of the fittest. That, of course, was controversial at the time, but has now become relatively ortho much orthodoxy. Mutations accumulate at a fairly steady rate in surviving lineages, the so-called molecular clock hypothesis of Emil Zucker Candle and Linus Pauling. That's also more or less a foundation of molecular evolution. And finally, something not too controversial. We can study the evolution of molecules and reconstruct the evolutionary history of organisms using their molecules. So that's what I think they were doing in the uh, Wilson lab, and that's where we got called in to do a bit of statistics. I have to show you the data, because remember, we start with data, we start with questions, we start with models. So here's the data first. I'll get the question later. These are aligned human globin proteins. And I'm sure you've all heard of hemoglobin. You know, there's an alpha globin and a beta globin, and a couple of each come together to form hemoglobin, which picks up the blood and transports, uh, picks up the oxygen, transports it. These strings of letters are abbreviations for the chemical structure of particular globins. Alpha globin, beta globin, delta, epsilon, and gamma are um, uh, different versions of globins that are used in fetus or uh, embryos, and uh, myoglobin in the muscles. So the string of letters are amino acids, and that, that's enough with a bit of help to uh, talk about the structure of a three-dimensional structure of a molecule. Not quite, you do need a little more. And the sequences would go up to about 146 amino acids. So I've stopped at 40, so you can see the letters. The dot here means the same. So for example, that W, tryptophan, all of those guys have a W in that spot, which is position 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. OK, so that's how you're supposed to read that. And that's the number of molecules. And they're all in humans. So there's no interesting organismal evolution in that picture. But I, I use it to start with just to give you the idea. So hopefully, that's the sort of data that we might play with. But the sort of thing that gets you interested in evolution is this sort of alignment. These are now the same globin, the beta globin, across different species. Now, uh, here the species are human, macaque, cow, platypus, chicken, and shark. Now, this is, of course, for Australian audience. We're all very familiar with humans, cows, platypuses, sharks. Uh, we're less familiar with macaques, so I had a picture of a macaque for people. <laughs> OK, so that is 146 amino acids for the beta globin for these different species. And this, is, this would be raw data for doing molecular evolution inference. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of features. Firstly, you'll notice that I have colored in this sort of cyan color, one, two, three, four, five, whoops, six, seven. Seven places at which the macaque beta globin sequence differs from the human. So comparing macaque to human, we get that. If you compare shark to human, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera, up to 91, as you'll see if you count quickly. So there are actually 91 differences along this molecule with the, uh, between the human and the shark, and exactly seven, which suggests maybe that this number of differences is in some sense indicative of the evolutionary difference, which of course was the point of the paper by Alan Wilson and Vince Sarich, which I'll come to. <coughs> so we've already noted that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we build up this array of numbers. I'll ask you to concentrate on the lower diagonal part first. See that seven there? That is the number of differences between the human and the macaque. Below the diagonal, observed number of amino acid differences out of a 146. So seven out of 146 here. If we convert it to a percentage, it's five out of 5% difference. So that's some measure of the difference between humans and macaques. Here's the 91, which is the number of differences between human and shark. And that converts to a 65% difference. So we've almost got ourselves a distance between the species based on their beta globin. Now, not quite. I want you to go back to this picture and notice if we have all these changes uh, between the human and the shark, it will occur to you that there might have been some changes on top of changes. 
And if we're only observing changes, we may miss out on some. So what about the changes on top of changes? That tells you immediately that percent difference is probably an underestimate of the real difference. Because if you had a change on top of a change, there's two things it could be. It could be different from the original, but you don't notice that there was two, or it could even go back to the original. And then you don't notice you had a change. So you've got to do something about that. And this is what happened. So here is the data I just showed you before, the 5% for the macaque, 65% for the human. Above the diagonal is the estimated number of substitutions, the estimated number of changes, not the observed number. That's these numbers. So that 65 goes up to 108. So you observe 65%, but we estimate that there was maybe 100% change, complete turnover. And where did that come from? That came from a formula by Charles Candor and Tom Jukes, published in 1969. And uh, that, in some sense, was the first serious piece of mathematics or of statistics in molecular evolution. And I want to show you very, very quickly. This is quite unrelated to my main theme, but it's so good I have to tell you about it. This is a comparison of molecular versus paleontological distance, published in 1971, very soon after this subject got going. Along here, we have millions of years since divergence. Up here, we have estimated amino acid changes per 100 residues. So that's the number that I was talking before. And we have lines here. And I'll just focus on the globin line. And a point here would correspond to, let's say, two species which were, let's say, 500 million years since they were together, a divergence time of 500 million years. And along here, maybe 80-something changes estimated per 100 amino acids. And in fact, the divergence between the bony fish and the cartilaginous fish is, in fact, dated at about 500 million years. And the difference between their, uh, their globins is about 80 to 90, uh, estimated to be about 80 to 90 changes. So you've got this relationship between the old style evolutionary dating and the new style, which was really pioneered by uh, many of the people I've mentioned, and in particular in relation to humans and apes, uh, Alan Wilson and Vince Sarich. Whoops. And another example here, Carp and Lamprey, excuse me, uh, a vertebrate insect here. That's a bit later. That's 600 million years. And this is a more slowly evolving molecule, so the slope is uh, more shallow. Uh, this doesn't change very much. Cytochrome C is a molecule involved in the mitochondria, which are in all cells with the nucleus. So we've got this sort of reality check that uh, these evolutionary distances measured by molecules do check out with other evolutionary distances. Of course, not always. And the cases where they don't are very interesting. I put this here because this was an incredible eye-opener to me as a person interested in evolution when I was a student, coming to the world of molecular evolution, which was so much more solid, it felt, than the sort of fuzzy stuff you learned about when you learned zoology or botany. And uh, I've, I've loved it ever since. And I really have to thank uh, Barbara and Alan for drawing me into it. OK, now another use of these distances is inferring trees. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but there's different ways of taking these distances to get a tree. And I'll just mention a few. The UPGMA is what, what that one's called, maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, many other methods. And the point of the question to me was all of these guys, implicit or explicit assumptions. They use models, implicitly or explicitly, which may fail and may lead to incorrect conclusions, which is why Sadly, statisticians get brought in, and we're supposed to give the truth and be confident about the truth. Well, so for example, here is a tree relating those species that I described earlier, human and macaque, very close, cow there, platypus coming out here, chicken here, and shark here. I haven't put a root on it, but if there was a root, it would be somewhere up there. So that's the sort of thing you can do with this distance data, and it's the sort of thing people were very interested in doing. And in particular, whoops, that was exactly, this is a figure straight out of the Surridge Wilson paper, where they're interested in deciding is this, this was the conventional representation of the re evolutionary connections between apes like chimps and gorillas and uh, old world monkeys there and humans, and whereas they thought it was this one, that we are much closer to the apes and much more distant from the monkeys. 
And if you look at the data in their 1969 paper, it was a no-brainer that they were right. As long as you believed that you're getting the right story from the molecules, which we now do. Uh, I want to put up a contemporary example that I'm actually a little bit involved in. Plasmodium is uh, the uh, genus of mal malaria parasites. Felsiparum is the nasty one that uh, kills children and is pretty painful for adults. Vivax is a relatively mild one. These are both human. Gallinaceum infects birds and Burgii infects mice or rodents. So one of the things that people are interested in there is just what's the right tree? You know, people look at that and they say, oh, did we get, did Felsiparum jump across from a bird? Sort of question you hear about when we're talking about flu. Or did it, uh, here's the bird again, but let's, here's one where the bird is out, the outgroup, then there was Felsiparum. Here's one perhaps uh, where, hmm, well, no one is really suggesting. Vivax is the other human one, much milder than Felsiparum, and, uh, you know, just getting the evolutionary relationship between these guys sorted out is a question of interest for, for several reasons I won't go into, but it is not resolved at this moment. Okay, so Naaman's paper had a little postscript, which comes back to the story of models. He wrote his paper, and he said he came to realize that one of the models he'd proposed was not realistic. Wilson and Surridge told him it was no good. Then he had some hope for the other one. And the other one turned out to be the first explicit statistical model for molecular evolution, uh, the, the forerunner of all the ones that are used today, basically. And uh, I'm going to just touch on that very briefly. It looked like this. At first, I want to say I'm switching to DNA now. Uh, these models were for DNA. My illustrations and all the early work was with uh, amino acids because that was the data they had at that time. But a little bit later, we started getting DNA data. That's the four-letter alphabet, A, C, T, G. And we're interested in evolution of those, like uh, changes, <coughs> probabilities of change from A, C, G, T to A, C, G, T. And you have different parameters in these matrices. And that's the way in which you summarize the model you're going to use to analyze the data. And a key issue in this literature was the stability of these parameters along the molecule. If you've got a long molecule, let's say, of a few hundred uh, base pairs, is this change, are the rates of change in the different positions the same? And uh, needless to say, the answer is no. And perhaps also needless to say, the simplest models assumed it was. And then the question was, can we do better? And uh, I'm going to be very quick now. This touches on the issue that we addressed, but it's too ugly to describe in detail. Things called phylogenetic invariance came on the scene by a guy called Jim Lake from UCLA and Jim Cavender from Colorado. And these were functions of probabilities in models that were supposed to be zero for one tree and not zero from another. So they looked as though they had great potential <laughs> for telling what's the true tree, which in some sense is the holy grail for many, many evolutionists. The hope was that they could be used to discriminate between competing trees without the assumption of identical distribution across sites. So that was what uh, we were asked to look at. And here's an example, 15 trees for four species. And then the question would be, what's the right one for a given set of data? And there were not really good methods around at that point. This is a bit of text from our paper, lots of incomprehensible mathematics. And the bottom line is, we got a method, <laughs> we published a paper, and it didn't work. OK, so the data were the aligned DNA sequences. The models were things that were more general than were being previously used. The method we tried was invariance. The answer was not much good. So summary of this example. Did we extract more information? Well, sadly, the answer was not really. It didn't work. It didn't catch on. And you've only got to look at the citations to discover that. And I have to say, people still work on invariance in the hope that they're going to get a version that works. And I don't think that's yet happened. But four, this is a fascinating and important topic. It threw up a challenging problem, hard to address as an amateur. Really, this topic of inferring trees turns out to require professionals people that devote their lives, or at least a good proportion of their lives, to this problem. But it was a great introduction to this incredibly important field, and I'm very grateful for it. So that's my first vignette. The others are much smaller. And uh, I don't know whether I should pause for questions, but I'm pausing anyway. <laughs>
So I hope you can see the, the interplay. What I've left out, of course, are the ugly details of the models and the mathematics. But basically, we've got some data. We've got a question. We try to address it. And you have to really get quite into the field. This is not, to my mind, terribly generic. The second example is what's known as interference in genetic recombination, or genetic, genetic cal. And uh, this was done in the lab of Bob Mortimer around 1995. And why were we interested in that? Why was he interested in that? Well, there's a thing called linkage mapping, which was and is still pretty important in genetics, which is about identifying the regions of chromosomes where the genes are located that influence observable traits. I mean, the most common example might be a disease. And you've got some sort of disease segregating in families. And if you do a linkage analysis of the family data, you can localize the genes that influence that trait, assuming it's a simple Mendelian trait, to not too small, but not too big regions of the genome, and then do more mapping. And also, people are very interested in recombination as a phenomenon. Whatever recombination is, that's the next slide. But first, this is the next slide but one. So there's Bob Mortimer, who sadly died three years ago, four years, five years ago. Um, this is his student, Jeff King, with whom I, we worked. Uh, that's Jeff and his wife outside Sproul Hall. And in case you can't tell, she is looking absolutely amazed. He has finished. He had just filed his PhD. So it's the sort of shock you get of a wife of a PhD student after about five years of uh, painful study. Uh, Mary Sarah McPeak worked with Jeff mainly on the problem that I'm talking about. And Hong Yu, another student of mine, was working too. Mary Sarah is a professor now at um, uh, University of Chicago. Hong Yu is a professor at, uh, at Yale. Jeff runs a biotech company in Oregon, and I forgot to give you the life history of the people earlier. Uh, Trang, my uh, student back in the first slide, works for Oracle, uh, so she's left science as we know it. Uh, Barbara, who was somewhere up there, uh, works at a well-known college called Mills College in Oakland, and I uh, forget who else was there. Uh, Arund is a professor at, dare I mention the word, Stanford, <laughs> in the genetics department at Stanford. So that's the team then. So this is the sort of diagram that brings fear into the heart of mathematicians. This is highly intrinsic biology. And I must say, when I first studied biology, it scared the hell out of me. Uh, I'm still never really got past prophase one, because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of interesting stuff up there. Uh, and <laughs> what I'm talking about is this part, this part here, where the chromosomes replicate, but they stay joined at their centromeres. Things that are called bivalence form, and chiasmata appear. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. And then they separate by attachment of the centromeres to the spindles. And you can see these guys separating. And then at metaphase one, they head off in different, different directions. So I'm zeroing in on that. And the rest is going to be kind of mathematical type diagrams. But first, Fisher was there first. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you're going to get a pattern here. <laughs> Any guesses for who might be there first in the third talk, in the third vignette? OK, Fisher wrote this paper in 1947. Uh, these are two of his PhD students, Mary F. Lyon and George Owen. Uh, he was professor of genetics at Cambridge by that point. Uh, he had gone from being statistician at Rothamsted Experimental Station to professor of eugenics, replacing Carl Pearson at, replacing half of Carl Pearson at University College London, then on to Cambridge. And then he wrote a paper on his own, a quantitative theory of genetic recombination and chiasma formation just a year later. And he gave a talk at Woods Hole, Massachusetts in 1947 about this paper. And I'm going to draw on a first-hand account of that talk in a few minutes. So what's the issue? We're going to look at the four-strand bundle, the so-called bivalent and exchanges there. And I'm only going to depict one chromosome arm. So here's a picture. That's one arm. And that thing there is meant to be the centromere. And there's another arm going there that we leave out. And of course, uh, pink for boys, or is it pink for girls and blue for boys? So let's say that's the uh, maternal chromosome and that's the paternal chromosome. They replicate, staying joined to the centromere. These two bits are called sister chromatids. So we have, and that's called the four-strand bundle or the bivalent. And the exchanges that I'm talking about happen at this point. And so here's a schematic where maybe the exchanges I'm interested in are between non-sister chromatids. 
there, are, there is evidence of exchange between sister chromatids that I'm not going to bother about, which would make this complicated. So this would be this sort of exchange. And we need to understand what happens if we have an exchange here. That means that when this centromere splits, and this goes to one spindle and that goes to another, this guy is going to be red, followed by blue, followed by red. So you have to see how to unwind them. The second one is going to be red followed, sorry, that, this one is going to be red followed by blue. This one hasn't been doing anything, <coughs> and this one would be blue followed by red, staying red. So that's how you get these guys, right? Uh, we had red followed by blue, this one, half of the top half. This one here, red, blue, red, that's this guy. Obviously, this one is that one, and this one here would be blue followed by red. So in these exchanges, you mix up the maternal and paternal chromosomes. And uh, you know, in a way, if I'm looking here, these guys, this is half of one chromosome. That goes into a sperm or an egg, which gets joined from stuff for the other parent. So by the time that gets into the next generation, these guys are grandparental. The blue would be from the grandfather and the red would be from the grandmother if uh, this is going into an offspring. <laughs> okay, and just to show you what these, these exchanges get visualized under a microscope, they're called chiasmas for a cross-like structure. And here is a, vision, a microscope picture of a chiasma colored according to the parental chromosomes. <laughs> so we're going to talk about briefly about models for this. And the models are needed for where these exchanges occur. They don't occur uniformly along chromosomes, so we need a model that explains where they occur. And we also need a model for which strands are involved. For example, if a particular pair of strands are involved in one exchange, does that make it more or less likely that they will be involved in nearby exchange? Indeed, is it more likely to have the exchanges nearby or further apart? Are they spaced out? Are they random? Those sort of questions. They're all part of these models. And in 1993, there were several such models. And King and Mortimer had a couple. Franklin Stahl in Oregon had one, quite similar, but not the same as ours. Ours was not original. And Fisher had his as well, but it wasn't considered for reasons I'll explain in a second. So we've got data, and I have to show you the data now, but almost there. <laughs> in fact, we didn't have data along the whole chromosome. We only have data on what are called markers, uh, and in fact, Markers that segregate, markers that can be tracked. So uh, here would be a situation where we had the four-strand bundle. We had markers, big A and little a, big B and little b, no exchange, one exchange. And then each of these goes off into a sperm or an egg, and we see the organism that results. <coughs> so <coughs> we can't tell the precise location of the crossovers, just whether or not the parental origins differ at adjacent markers. That is, we can tell that if we got this guy, that this is a big A and a little b, not a big A and a big B. So it's, it's slightly complicated. I'm not going to go into the details. But basically, back in those days at least, we couldn't see the whole chromosome. We could just see at occasional spots. So we can basically tell whether there's been a change, one change, or three changes, or no change, or two. For example, here, big A ends up back with big B. So you have two changes. But A and B, at the A and B loci, you don't see anything different. So there are some subtleties here. And this is the data that we used. Uh, I'll mention other data later. This is some data from Morgan, Bridges, and Schultz, 1935. Everybody was using this data right up until quite recently. Uh, and if you see the number here, this is 16,136 meioses. This is data from Drosophila at nine loci along the X chromosome of Drosophila. And they have these colorful names, scutokinus, cross-veinless, cut, vermilion, and so on. So uh, I don't want to go into the details, but people studied the X chromosome because it was pretty easy to decide through sexual transmission whether a trait was on the X chromosome of the fly. And somebody was looking at 16,000 flies after these quite complicated crosses to build up this body of data. And I wish I had time to explain more, but I don't. So I'll just say that this is the data we used, and it's not far from perfect. Nine loci, eight intervals, and we could tell whether, th whether we had an odd or an even number of exchanges 
in each of these intervals. That was what we got. <coughs> now, what did we do? Well, Mary Sarah used the Monte Carlo method to maximum likelihood fitting. Maximum likelihood is definitely one of these generic uh, statistical methods. Uh, we couldn't fit it in the normal way, but we could use simulation to fit it. And that was already moderately novel at that time, although it's much more common now. In addition to goodness of fit, we calculated what's called the four-point coincidence function. And the four-point coincidence function you think about like this, that here's four points represented by my four fingers, and you're interested in the chance of an exchange in this one, given that you have an exchange here. So if I tell you I've got a crossover in that little interval of the chromosome, how likely is it that I have one in this position in the same meiosis as a function of the distance apart? That's a very key characteristic, which turned out to be able to allow you to distinguish models. And here's the uh, sort of piece de resistance of our paper, where we looked at observed, which are the dots, and predicted, which are the estimated, or there's a formula for that one, coincidence, four-point coincidence functions, as a function of what's called genetic distance that I won't go into. It's not the physical distance along the chromosome, but it's uh, a very special distance. And here are the two King and Mortimer models. Here is the model we liked. And you can see this wiggly line here is an estimated coincidence function for their first model. And it's a little bit high down here and a little bit low up here. This guy is really way out compared to the data. And this one, we like to think, is just right. It's not too low in the high, and it's sort of, well, it doesn't capture all that, but it's not bad. But this uh, enabled us at least to discriminate between these three models. And we had several others as well that I'm not presenting. So that's, uh, that's the second vignette. But I want to tell you about R.A. Fisher's model because it's kind of a nice story. Now, James F. Crow is a very famous geneticist who died in January of this year, and he used to write historical comments and in 1990, he wrote one on the centenary of Fisher's birth. And he said that in 1947, Joshua Lederberg and he sat together at Woods Hole. Fisher was president of the Biometric Society, gave a major address, and which, uh, amongst other things, he had a model of recombination or interference which permitted recombination above 50%. Now, I haven't had time to tell you that that's unusual. <laughs> But the data with Mary Lyon and uh, George Owen and Fisher, Fisher Lyon and Owen had recombination fractions. We were both taken aback <coughs> by his not taking into account the four-strand nature of crossing over and exchange whispered expressions of incredulity. <coughs> Later, Lederberg asked the question why he used a two-strand model. And Fisher said, I can just see him saying it, young man, it is not a two-strand model. It is a one-strand model. Now, I have to explain what that means first. Well, one, two, or four. Fisher was modeling the changes along the meiotic products, the single strand that comes out at the end. The four-strand model models the four strands together. And of course, exchanges in one are interacting with exchanges of the other. There was a simple but erroneous two-strand model around, has been around for many years and won't die, but it's there. And the four-strand model had a history going back to 1909, Janssen's, was widely accepted by the 30s. But Fisher and his students definitely did not want to use it. They knew about it, they didn't want to use it. And I say there, it's a modeling error. And the answer is, why is it a modeling error? Well, first, I just want to tell you, this is a picture from a book on linkage analysis in the late 80s. I got this off the web a year or two ago. So people still think the, the two-strand model has got some credibility, but uh, it hasn't. Well, why was it wrong? So I wrote to Mary Lyon, who, she was a PhD student in 1947. She's now a somewhat elderly lady and the uh, most distinguished, uh, one of the most distinguished geneticists in the UK. Dear Dr. Speed, it's very interesting to have a query about such an old paper. As far as I know, nothing was ever published about this apparent, nothing more was ever published. However, I can tell you, the results did not stand up. These genes, Waver and Shaky, were definitely not sex-linked. They're on chromosome 11, and have always been. The paper was not believed. Both Wavy and Shaky have changed their names. One is the EGFR, and this is a Myo 15. So the thing was, Fisher had a lousy model by doing it on one strand rather than on four. Really easy models on one strand, 
uh, didn't work. The same easy model on four did. Thank you, Mary Lyon. So, summary. <coughs> We definitely extracted more information. We were able to distinguish models that had previously not been able to be distinguished. Uh, my interest in interference was rewarded, so I was pretty happy with that. I think we made a small contribution to genetics. Uh, Fisher's story was interesting. It actually didn't help genetic mapping. Linkage mapping was unaffected by all these fancy models once we figured out how to use them. <coughs> so that's the end of vignette two. And we're not far off finishing with vignette three, which is very fast. Okay. So this is, uh, we're getting into the modern era. This is about 10 years ago. Normalization of complementary DNA microarray data. I'm going to tell you a little about what that means. Uh, with the lab of John Nye, and I didn't see John earlier, but I guess he's probably arrived by now. Uh, why are we doing it? Well, John was studying the olfactory system and doing these microarray experiments to learn about gene expression in the uh, olfactory bulb. And uh, in general, though, people are using microarray data and they wanted to measure gene expression as well as they could. This is the team that was involved. There's John up there looking slightly younger than he looks today with all his robotic gadgetry that I'll mention in a sec. Uh, Percy was one of John's students who's there looking like a martial arts expert. Gene was my PhD student who kind of hung out in the lab with John and Percy a lot. And Sandrine was uh, a postdoc at Stanford, but working closely with us uh, on all this work. So, uh, and of course, Sandrine is now a professor at Berkeley. John is still a professor at Berkeley. Percy's at the National University of Singapore. And Gene is at the University of Sydney in Australia. Okay, so this is the worst picture of the talk, but it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> We're interested in these things called microarrays. Now, microarrays are really, if you, take, if you think of a glass microscope slide, which looks like that, uh, <laughs> with a bit of a barcode at the end, and you might have on that 40,000 little pieces of DNA which have been spotted. <laughs> and you get those little pieces of DNA by taking things called microtiter plates with lots of little holes, and you get the robot to dip into the hole <coughs> and touch a bit of DNA and then put it on the right spot on the, on the glass slide. So that's what's happening here, that we're having all the stuff in these guys. You might have 100 of these guys, and each of that has 400. So that would be 40,000 little bits of different DNA. In an ideal world, there'd be one good one for each gene. You might have multiples. They get printed on the slide using a robot. So this thing here, make up the product, print them on a the slide, and you get that guy. Then over here, messenger RNA target. Not time to tell you what messenger RNA is, but let's think of it as uh, stuff that is expressed genes. And there are always two types. Here it says reference, and uh, I guess that says test. So two types in this particular type of microarray. <coughs> and they get labeled with two fluorescent dyes. So this one's being labeled green, this one's being labeled red. They get put together and stuck on this slide, and a chemical reaction called hybridization takes place. And we don't need to know a lot about that. That all happens there. And then we go up to here, and we take our glass slide again. And this is now after the chemical reaction. So every one of those little dots of DNA has now got a certain amount of red stuff and a certain amount of green stuff stuck to it by the DNA base pairing. And we're interested in the relative amounts of red and green. So what happens is you fire a laser at two, or two, two different wavelengths of laser and get an image, the green image and the red image. And the green image and the red image are going to turn out to be almost our data. We actually do a little image processing first. So if I... Uh, Go back to a picture like this now. This will be the data from a complementary DNA microarray, which is what these guys are called. We've got the two images. You do a bit of processing, and you get a long list of numbers. There might be 40,000 lines in this Excel file. And uh, the red data is one set of columns, and the green data is the other. So you're firing the laser at 635 or 532 nanometers and getting these singles. So, this is the raw data that comes from one of these experiments. This says here, overlay the images and normalize. Well, this normalizing is what I'm going to tell you about. <coughs> OK? So uh, only one of these columns is really needed. 
but there's a background and a foreground here, and we typically mess around with them. So now, of course, uh, if you remember that I had Fisher getting there first and I had Naaman getting there first. So Chuki had almost been there first, but not quite. Chuki wrote a famous paper in 62 called The Future of Data Analysis. He wrote a famous book in 77 called Exploratory Data Analysis. And basically, he made a philosophy and encouraged the world to look at their data and think about it. And in particular, one of his protégés, Bill Cleveland, wrote a book published in 93, Visualizing Data. <laughs> and he had this particular plot in his book. I don't remember reading it, but I dug it out for this talk, <coughs> where he plotted, he had a lot of pairs. And he plotted the average of the pairs that way, and he plotted the difference of the pairs that way. And if these pairs were more or less the same, they would kind of bounce around the zero line. And if one of the pairs was bigger, then they might be off the zero. And he put a line through that called a low S line, a locally weighted empirical scatter, spot, scatter plot smoother. And that is perhaps the beginning and end of our contribution to microarrays. So we saw the need for something, and we called it normalization. So what people used to do before we came on the scene, they would plot the green intensity on one axis and the red intensity on the other. And they'd get a cloud of points, maybe 40,000 of them, and they'd be a few away from the diagonal, these colored ones. And they're the interesting ones where red is bigger than green. So that's a red versus green plot. So we thought following Chuki, firstly, take logs. Chuki said always take logs, almost. <laughs> uh, and plot the average versus the difference. And I have to ask you to remember that the difference of logs is a log of a ratio, because they want ratios. So that thing there. That doesn't look terribly well scattered around zero. And if you put a smooth line through it, uh, it certainly doesn't look like the zero line. But that's what you would expect. And that's pure chuki. Look, transform, re-express. That gave us this plot. And then if you make that red line there the zero line, everything is now nice, symmetric about there, and your, your guys are sticking out up here. Locally recenter using that. So that's the beginning and end of what we did, almost, uh, for so-called normalizing these microarrays. And we saw the need for it everywhere. Here is uh, NIH in Bethesda, NCI in Bethesda. This is one of John Nye's. This is one in Melbourne. This is another one at Berkeley. <coughs> Nobody was getting a nice straight line when you looked at it that way. People looked at it this way, and it didn't look too bad. If you basically transform it, it looks terrible. And you've got to do something about it. So we, our things seem to help. The question was, was it biologically valid? And John helped us design, or John designed this experiment, validation using a pool titration series. These cyan-colored dots there were ones that he knew had to be on the horizontal line. They were spiked in. They were put in to have equal concentrations. The red line is the line through all of the data. And as you can see, they check out pretty well. So the spiked in the titration series matched pretty much what we got from all the data. So in this particular case, at least, it worked very well. And that was it. This is not complicated modeling. This is not fancy statistics. It's simple data analysis. <laughs> so looking back on this, we definitely extracted more information. This has been one of my most widely cited papers, and it's almost the simplest. Uh, if it looks interesting, it's probably an artifact. Well, this was. This is a feature of the dyes. The dyes bleach in different ways. Some questions have simple answers, and the value of a method has little connection to its technical difficulty. This was really easy, but it was really helpful. So you can get lucky if somebody brings you a problem like that. The prepared mind, of course. Thank you very much.